Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Everfree Radio. And I am here today with a guest that I've been looking forward to, to speaking with for a long time. I know a lot of you out there have been looking forward to hearing from her. Tabitha St. Germain, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Well, and again, I just want to thank you right off the bat for joining us. I know that you've got an incredibly busy schedule and, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Oh, my pleasure. I'm, I'm very hoarse because I've, I've been uh, yelling and screaming all day long. Uh, but uh, horses are things that we're all fond of. So <laughs> and I think everybody was thinking that pun right as you made it. <laughs> I know. I know. Why did I even say it? Because you have to say the obvious sometimes. Do you mind if I call you final draft? You can if you'd like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, let me just ask a general question just right off the bat. How did you become involved with My Little Pony Friendship is Magic? Well, sir, <clears throat> as happens, I got a call that I had an audition for My Little Pony. Mind you, I've been in, like, okay, I've been in, I think, probably four generations of it already beforehand. Uh, played Minty and Wisteria and ooh, Thistle Whistle and somebody and Hoojima Flip and a little star thingy. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but memorable characters, all of them. Memorable characters, all. No, I love playing Minty. I think uh, Pinkie Pie is the new Minty. And yeah, so so. And I was told uh, when I went in for the audition not to do anything I'd done before. So I steered very cl- – I didn't actually read for Pinkie Pie or for um, or for Fluttershy because she was the Wisteria corollary. And um, so I just – and also I looked at Pinkie Pie and I went, oh, she's going to freak out and be a mental case through this whole thing. <laughs> so I just – oh. Today, that day, I was like, oh, it just looks so hard. <laughs> so I just didn't bother. But uh, I read for Rarity, and I, I believe, I'm not c- completely sure, because it's so long ago in the sands of time, that they had, uh, as a reference, Audrey Hepburn. And mm-hmm. I'm wretched at doing impressions or anything like that, but I, I sort of knew what they meant, that she had that graciousness and sort of extension of acceptance and welcome and yet she had this very posh sounding pretty really pretty really clear voice um so i took that and then didn't do it (laughs) did something else that just gradually got a bit more and more egoic i suppose um uh, ego is very funny there's nothing funnier than somebody with a massive ego uh, <laughs> and I think Rarity's got a, oh, you know, she's got a, a, a healthy sized uh, ego, which makes it easy for her to to fall distances and rise up distances. So, <laughs> so I really like playing her. Is, does that answer your question? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that you know, that's that's actually a great beginning to the. I was going to say you you said you mentioned that you originally had intended to uh, to model her a little bit off of Audrey Hepburn, but I got to say when I heard your performance as Rarity, I'm always reminded of Catherine Hepburn. Oh um, wow. Yeah, I, 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 it's particularly there's one moment in one episode. I believe it's uh, Sister Who's Social where you, where you go, "What have I done?" And and it's it just <laughs> Range, you know, immediately had that image in my mind. Wow, did she have? Did she, was, uh, was that war- warble in there somewhere? Well, I think it, I think it was more of an earlier Catherine Hepburn, maybe not the <laughs> the one from the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, but you know, it's weird. She's definitely she's definitely got that sense of sophistication to her, and you're right. She's got that that ego that that kind of shines through, but she also has almost an innocence about it. Like she's not aware yeah. that she sounds that way. Well, you know, frequently, I, I think it's astonishing, but frequently people with massive egos are really innocent. Uh, you know, because there is a little bit of a blind side about themselves, right? So, uh, uh, Well, that would explain me. Oh! I, I, I don't know. But... <laughs> now, now. You... <laughs> 
<laughs> You're lovely. Come on. <laughs> well, but you know, aside from that, though, I mean, yeah, Rarity never does come off as too egotistical. That was actually something, one of the original things I noticed about her character as a new fan of the show, that she... You know, you would expect the stereotypical, you know, um, posh character to be arrogant, to be, you know, you know, to have that tone of voice, but also to have a certain snideness behind it. And and she doesn't have that. No, no. You're looking for the kind of nastiness because oftentimes when there's vanity, you have to defend the vanity. You know, you see a really beautiful woman walking down the street and oftentimes she's like, what? There's a there's a kind of like a (laughs) little kind of (laughs) Stop looking at me, kind of thing, because you have to defend that, that uh, the the vanity, the the you know it's an illusion, right? So there's there's a lot invested in sort of keeping a distance from because it's 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 made out of eggshells and paper mache. It's just completely bustable. So um, indeed, yeah. So often, so often, like massive egos hide really squishy cores. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and often there's a great deal of innocence, and that's that's just how opposites work, and it's a lovely it's a lovely thing, and it's why you can forgive somebody sometimes, you know, or often yeah, that just operates with more ego than you may be used to, you know. Yeah, well, and the thing is too, uh, when you're talking about this this exploration of ego through the, through the character, you know, uh, there's another character you play one. My personal favorite character of the entire show, um, named uh, Luna, which I think everybody out there, you know, <laughs> is excited to hear about as well. She has an episode in season two, Luna Eclipsed, where she really goes through that whole gambit. She starts off as incredibly, you know, haughty, using that tone of, uh, you know, that loud speaking tone, and and of course that's somewhat through the writing. But then she, by the end of the episodes, has a bit more of the innocence to it. And I, I just wanted to know. If for you that episode was almost an exploration of that separation, as it were, because it seems like you try to mix those elements for rarity, but for Luna, it's a little more exaggerated. Yeah, oh, I hadn't really thought of a correlation between the two, but that's that's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, you know, I I don't really know I don't really know how uh, how, uh people ask me this all the time. You know, well, can I teach a class or whatever and tell me how you do things. And I, I don't actually know, um, <laughs> how, how I do things. You you just do them. And I'm sure it's based on everything that I've listened to before. And, um, you know, I think of all those great, those great old, um, villains that, uh, you know, the, mm, not Cruella de Vil, I'm thinking of one of these Queens, I think it was in Sleeping Beauty or so, or Snow White or something. Oh, there's like uh, Maleficent or I can't remember. Her. Yes, that's precisely it. And I, and I was thinking of, of that and, and, uh, or I wasn't thinking of it, but you know, it's in my vocabulary of stuff that I saw of, of people. Uh, and you, and you, you always wonder about them. You always wonder about when somebody's really just behaving so cut off and so, um, into power, what can they possibly believe? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they must be believing in some kind of, they must be afraid, essentially. If they have to control other people's behavior, they have to make them do what they need to be. They must be, they, they must be afraid. There must be, again, a little squishy thing in there. So, um, so I, I kind of love that. I still don't know how it happens, though. You just open your mouth and stuff comes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be working. I mean, at people all I know tons of people who, you know, name your characters as their favorites. And, and a big reason why is just the, is the acting behind it. And I've also, you know, spoken or Everfree Radio has spoken with a lot of the voice talent of the show. And time and again, we hear the same thing. Tabitha is such an inspiration. Honestly, I hear that from I heard that from Ashley Ball. I heard that from uh-huh. uh, from uh, Kathy at one point. Uh, you know, just Andrea, of course, and and they all say the same thing. And it's funny when you say you don't know how they do it because they all say that they kind of look to you in a sense as a mentor in, <laughs> in some regards. Well, um, I think it's a sort of a 
Um, I think that with uh, younger actors, I've definitely, by being a complete nut job, given them permission to be nut jobs, <laughs> and that's the only <laughs> way I can see that that would that because I I you know I never say. I've, I've never said to someone, you know, if I do murmur, murmur with my voice, then I achieve because I, I don't know. I honestly don't know how I come by it uh, or how it comes by me, I should say. So, yeah, but but I think by being at ease with it and also treating it really quite lightly, because even though it's serious and it's your career and uh, people are watching you can be in the hundreds of thousands sometimes. And if you thought about it, you would lose your mind. It's a, it's a serious job like everything, but you need to take it lightly, you know? Um, and because you need as a voice actor permission to play and muck about and fail, fail <laughs> massively. No, you need permission to fail more than anything. You know, you need to be in the mind of, a little tiny child uh, with the doll and just marching it around the table with with your other doll characters and going, you did this, I don't like you. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Have you ever had any catastrophic failures then in your career? I'm just curious. Brazilians. (laughs) Brazilians. Hundreds of thousands, and I count them as the best things that have happened to me. Mostly, my my like my most colossal failures have happened uh, in on camera auditions because I'm shy, basically, and because I have a hard time remembering lines. And so sometimes, you know, I went to an audition for um, oh, what's that new series? Not grim, but uh, it's the fairy tale thing. Oh, uh, never uh, happily never after. Oh, what happily, is it? Happily, I know what you're talking about. I think it's happily ever after. And um, I went into audition for a uh, what do you call it? A fairy godmother. And um, at the time, in order to get over to get over myself, essentially, I'd been doing this YouTube <laughs> show about a fairy that gets uh, that possesses the body of a. Um, extremely conservative uh, legal secretary (laughs) to do a cooking show in order to do a cooking show. So, and I've been posting these, these little episodes uh, periodically on the tube. So I get this audition and it's for a fairy godmother. I'm like, Oh, I've got this. I've actually got a fairy crown. I've got a wand. I've got some silly clothes. And I went all decked out, like all decked out to this audition and then I was told, you know, just seconds before I went into the room, you know, the tone of the show is really quite, it, they said it differently than this, but they said it's really quite, um, it's really realistic. <laughs> 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 so I went in and the director, the first thing he said to me was, can you take the crown off, please? <laughs> just completely flat. <laughs> just no, no humor, no I'm not playing with you, you mental human. You're like the, <laughs> the person that goes on American Idol that has no concept of what our norm of reality is, and you think you know what you're doing, but you don't. <laughs> so, oh man, I took the crown off. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I took the crown off and I said my lines as I memorized them, you know. And I had to talk nice to myself for a week, and then you know, <laughs> but. But those are those are glorious, glorious things. They feel hot and horrible at the time. <laughs> and and I've had millions of them. Well, not millions, but I've had thousands of them. I can I think I can honestly say thousands of them. And they've been particularly with on camera auditions um, where I've just not grokked the uh, vibration or I've gotten really wrapped up in not uh fear of not remembering the lines or something <laughs> failed and just tanked gloriously <laughs> well you know in, in my favorite episodes of uh, american idol are the worst of episodes <laughs> i have a tradition i order pizza and i and i watch those those guys belt away and and the judges cringe you know but i gotta imagine you know i I think that's a really positive and really healthy way to approach those kinds of situations (laughs) is if you survive that sort of thing and you can laugh at it later you know oh but those poor buggers those poor buggers you know they have it broadcast on on national tv and everybody's all as again 
as I said in our sort of pre-discussion, the, the mainstream media in that kind of shamey, blamey place. And that's horrible. I mean, yeah. you know, if somebody yells at you in traffic and you and you feel kind of sick for the whole day sometimes. And But you imagine the vibrations of so many people focused on how rubbish you are. <laughs> that's got to be absolutely... <laughs> That's got to be wretched, absolutely wretched. But if you can just, you know, just if you can just have a, a lovely failure to yourself and process it and, and kind of go, hey, you know what? I sucked at that. I love myself anyway. I want to try again and see if I can get it right. That's awesome. I think that's really, again, one of the healthiest approaches you can take. I mean, like I, I mentioned before uh, we started the official you know, the official, official recording part, I, I'm a high school speech coach. And that's one of the first things I teach my uh, my students is I said, you have to be able to fail and own it, you know, oh, and yeah. be able to move on. Because it's like the actor that trips on stage. If he or she gets up and just keeps on going, the audience will respect them more for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is true of really a lot of what you... Uh, what you do in life if you know you have those moments if you can overcome them you well you come out stronger oh yeah and and you know when you actually do break through when you, you for me when i've finally gone to an audition and remembered all the lines without worrying about them and uh, and being able to just be the character because it's very very different on camera there's so many mechanical things that i never worried about when i worked on stage um, I, I was always really, really confident when I was on stage, but on camera, you know, the, the minutia of your expression and so forth. Um, and you just basically can't not hide anywhere. And so everything that you haven't processed about yourself, you know, when you're working on stage, it comes up five minutes before you go on stage. Everything that's wrong with you is like, <laughs> <laughs> And then you go out on stage and, well, for me, I, and I, it, would, it would just vanish because I had this ability when I was working on stage to just be in that one moment and not bring anything of the day or anything of anything else except the play and the moment onto the stage with me. But on camera, because you have to keep an awareness of everything else in the room and where your feet are and who's looking at you and um, where your eye line is and... You know, all sorts of variables that I don't entirely understand or didn't entirely understand. Well, I can say don't. I still don't. Um, that uh, it, it kind of throw it would. Yeah, it would make you too sort of. Mm, I don't know what open to uh, wondering Maybe. what. What we, what you might have messed up, right? Like uh, just sort of looking around rather than being maybe a little too self conscious, perhaps, or yeah, yeah, because you just don't, you know, you don't have, you don't know everything that you may possibly not have understood. Whereas when you go on stage, all you need to understand because you've rehearsed, 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 right? You've had six weeks generally of rehearsal, and uh, all you need to understand is your internal life and the and the life of the people around you that by this point in time you've had a lot of experience with but by and large when you go on camera or at least when i've gone on camera you've had a day yeah <laughs> and you've had your life you know what i mean so it's kind of like that yeah well and you know then that kind of brings me to a question about how you approach voice acting because you have a very extensive uh repertoire of roles you've filled i mean you've you've played in oh i'm i'm looking right now at a, a lengthy list you were in <laughs> all the way back to my childhood you were in uh legend of zelda the cartoon i mean you were you've been in a lot of animes like death note and dragon ball z and yeah. inuyasha and mm -hmm. gundam this a gundam that you know my question for you then is do you approach things similarly to how you approach your theater work i mean obviously it's not in front of a live audience but from what I've heard from the other VAs, especially up in Vancouver, uh, you know, when you're all performing in the studio together, is that more of a theater feel to you? Does it have more of that kind of dynamic? Uh, no, not really. We don't, you know, you, you read your script, but you don't prep to the degree that you do. Like, you, I mean, everything when you're working in the theater is geared towards the night. So you don't even eat a, 
a, a meal with anything excess in it. You know, you, you have to be so disciplined about your life in order to just have the energy to get through uh, musical theater or even even plain old theater. So uh, it does. It's not that um, it's not as difficult, I would say. It's far more like a bunch of siblings at dinner. <laughs> it's you you get there and you throw the buns across the table at one another you argue over the mustard you uh you tell the stories of your day it's it's very kind of familial and uh when somebody new comes a strange cousin from another country or whatever <laughs> you know uh, when somebody new enters the fold it's it's kind of like um it's a trip to sort of to to welcome them to the <laughs> to the crew and I, and I always love new blood in the studio and kind of letting them see our weird family dynamics because <laughs> it's very it's very very familial it's uh you know as as opposed to film I've found that uh, in on film sets everyone has a real sense of hierarchy you know even the second hairdresser to the star wants you to know she's not the third hairdresser to the star or you know mm. and and there's a real sort of r- rigid kind of not rigid but there's a real there's an in place pecking order and with cartoons at least here in in Vancouver it's much more you kind of get there and you almost have a uh, it's a weird way to describe it but a, a a shared selfishness if you know what i mean like everyone in the room is the most important person in the room. So they shut their stuff. They get out there and they do their thing. And everybody's like, oh my God, I love the thing that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the, I find that really, really joyous because, you know, you, I feel like everyone that gets up to do their turn, you celebrate. And, um, and I love my fellow performers. They're so awesome in this show and 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 so many others but you know the girls they are wonderful <laughs> well i know uh one thing that they told me that some some of the girls told me was that uh that you actually are a provider of baked goods to some of the sessions and i think it was andrea who told me that she doesn't feel like she's ready to record unless she's had some of the uh the the stuff that you bring in <laughs> Yeah, what can I say? I like to feed things. <laughs> I like to feed things at home in the studio. Animals. I even feed crows. Oh, I love I crows. Do. They're smart. I love crows too. They look at you with one eye and then they turn the whole head and then look with the other eye and they're like, mm, from this angle, not so much. <laughs> they're very judging, but I've always personally had a, a real affinity for arrogant animals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Persian you know, cats I- or... Uh... Or oh, Persian King Charles cat. Spaniels, or any of those kind of you know, yeah, I love them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I love any animal, fur, feathers, love it. Well, okay, so you, you know, we mentioned, we touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but you know, a lot of these voice actors that you're working with on My Little Pony, you actually work with in other shows as well. Uh, for example, Martha Speaks seems to be a big hub for uh, for <laughs> pony actors. Um, you know. Do you find that your dynamic working on My Little Pony with those actors is different than your dynamic working on the other shows with them? Um, well, it's very much girl world. So, you know, because usually there's there's like four girls or five girls in the studio. So when we have uh, the men folk in the room, it's it's a bit different. When we get like Lee, Tokar, and... <laughs> yeah, and... Um, What's his name? The other mental case. Um, uh, Peter New, perhaps? Peter New is mental. Yes, he is. But I was thinking of Inuyasha guy, Richard Cox. Yeah. When, <laughs> when Richard Cox and Lee are in the room, it's, it's, it's astonishing how the dynamic is just <laughs> something else altogether. Because we actually, um, the girls are quite kind of, your turn, my turn, and I pass the ball to you, and here it goes. And it, it's sort of, we're very polite with each other. <laughs> we're very kind of easygoing with, when the guys come in, it's, that's when the, that's when the, um, 
the peas start to fly across the table and the <laughs> mashed potatoes disappear from under your nose. And <laughs> it's, and they're, uh, they're, but you know, they're very funny. God, they're so funny. That episode, um, uh, the dog and pony show with Lee and, and Richard, um, was so ridiculous, <laughs> so ridiculous <laughs> to work on. They are so funny. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, well, that had to have been a fun episode for you to do as well, because Rarity goes through the, a whole bunch of different emotions in that in that episode. I mean, there's the I guess the the scene that Spike has where she's uh you know where she's swooning you know or and then and there's the determination. And of course, there's everybody's favorite line, and I can say this on behalf of the fandom. Everybody loves the "That's not whining, this is whining." <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that quoted. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's good writing, you know. That's that it's just good writing. I mean, I I love taking credit for it, but it's not my credit to take, because you know it really is. It's just it's just awesome writing, and it's where you know uh, where somebody has. I love it when somebody uses my character to the nth of its you know scope, and it doesn't always happen. And sometimes peculiar things happen, and you go, "What would I say something like that?" You know, you can't say anything. You're an actor. Um, or we, uh, so we really are at the mercy of, of what's, what's written for us. Um, but sometimes we just get gold. And that was one of those that was one of those instances. I also really loved that episode. Ah, bloody hell. I can't remember what it's called. It's the one the, the one where we have the sleepover at Twilight. Do you know what that's called? Yeah, that's um, I know which one it is. It's a season one episode. It's uh-huh. uh. Oh my goodness! I'm, you know what? I'm gonna look this up because if I don't, if we don't say it on air, we're gonna get nothing but <laughs> vitriol. Uh, I, okay, can't well. I can't remember, but you know, it's the play. The the for me, uh, I don't know how how other people felt about it, but for me, there it is. The use. It's look before we sleep, look, or before you sleep. Look before you sleep. The the use of character in that was just fantastic because it you know it pits the opposites between um applejack and and rarity and they you know you can just get her you could get all that sort of fussiness of rarities and you could get all the earthiness of applejack and those things you know countering one another that's just going to be so much fun i mean drama is all about conflict right and and um and uh yeah so anyway i i really love playing that episode as well that was a really lovely. Well, I think that, I think that everybody loves Rarity's character just because she is so over the top with the drama, but it's harmless. You know, there there are episodes where she falls onto a fainting couch. This is the worst possible thing, you know, and <laughs> and, and I think people, it really makes her endearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 so surprised by that. I'm so surprised that that, that reaction that people didn't go, oh, what a cow for a horse. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's lovely that's lovely that that people kind of see the soul in her well because d- i do well and, and it shows it really does i mean like i said earlier she you know you can tell she's not that standard you know snarky character she's you know she's got she's got emotion behind what she does and i mean and it yeah i, I think people just they just eat it up they eat it up whenever she acts over the top <laughs> i do too more, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, do you have any favorite lines or any favorite scenes that you performed? I mean, you mentioned earlier uh, the, the scene from uh, Dog and Pony Show, and you also mentioned, uh, you know, from, uh, oh, my, look before you sleep. Uh, but I was wondering if you had any particular specific lines or any specific, because the thing is that you've actually played several characters on the show. And aside from uh, everyone's favorites, Luna and, and, and uh, Rarity, you also play Granny Smith, which I imagine must be a lot of fun to play as, you know, an old lady, which yes, I, I can do. Yeah, yeah, I like her a lot. Um, well, I the, the thing about me is I, I never remember things. I actually went to um, Comic-Con in San Diego to uh, hang out at the Hasbro booth and do all that stuff. And I was like, oh, dang, I've got to I've got to look up the show because I just I don't remember, Uh, you know, you do you do so many characters and and uh, and what if somebody asks me about this episode or that episode? So I bought the DVD, 
But now, uh, or a DVD, let me say, and it's got, it just has five episodes on it. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't have the whole season. So I, I was only versed really in five episodes. <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, thick through all of them. So and then I was looking stuff up on the Internet, but it's very spotty. And I, and I, I, I don't remember um, everything that I've ever done. However, I do remember that I loved playing the Phoenix. <laughs> you, you played the Phoenix. The Phoenix, the one, is it Phil- Philomena? She had a yeah, Philomena. Philomena, yeah, and because um, all I had to do was cough and splutter, and uh, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I had no idea that you played that yeah. Phoenix. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I loved playing that character. That was a great deal of fun, and I loved playing photo finish. And um, Andrea and I were baby cakes, and that was fun because we just got to scream and go mental for absolutely ages and we drove everyone nuts and it's always fun it's always fun well you know i think photo finish is one of those background characters that that you know people don't admit to having tried to impersonate but they do um (laughs) you know they try everybody has their own version you know oh yeah the magics or whatever i can't do it i'll never try but uh yeah the magics people love that character and she only appeared in one episode and you know you know, foot or shy. Foot or shy. I know. There was, because I had, um, I used to have a dog. She's now passed away, but um, I had this dog and I used to walk her in the morning and I would always meet this Austri- Austrian lady <laughs> and, <laughs> and and talk to her. And, and basically that's who she was. That's, um, it was, a, she's a very old Austrian lady, but she had such a, uh, a, a presence about her, and she was very abrupt. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, that's who Photo Finish was. She was the the lady with the with the great big fluffy white dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it almost seems like it, it it fits. You know, if you're going to run into an abrupt Austrian woman, <laughs> she ought to have a fluffy white dog. She had an enormous fluffy white dog, and she'd brush it, and the hair would fly across the field. It was like a snowfall. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a Samoyed. I know everything about that. Oh, really? Oh. Oh, yeah. Shedding everywhere. Um, but but such a fun dog. It's really oh, loving. We love dogs. So you teach <laughs> speech, and and I do. so what? Um, how do you uh, how do you approach that? What do you what? Do, how do you teach speech? Well, what I teach particularly is uh, is public address speech. So I actually teach more of. Um, well, I, te- I actually coach uh, public address speech, and then I also coach debate for high schoolers. And so it's more of the, you know, f- presenting information, um, you know, things like, well, interviews, um, and also, uh, you know, <laughs> speaking, you know, persuasively about a topic. Uh, that's the general gist of what I coach. Um, so it's less of the acting side of things and more of the, you know, here's how you convince someone of an argument side of things. But huh. actually, speech is how I came across the show. I have a student named Joey who uh, recently graduated, and he did a he did a speech about Internet memes, and he presented a website that featured a lot of image uh a lot of image memes and I kept seeing images of, of these ponies all over the place. And eventually I ended up watching that. And later on, I found out that, uh, that, uh, he actually, and a couple of my other students were bronies and, uh, they didn't know that I did the podcast for a while. And then they found out and that was fun. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. But yeah, you know, I approach I approach speech. There are certain elements I think that are the same between dramatic type speech or dramatic type acting um, and public address type speech, which really is you know an engagement with the audience, recognizing the role of the audience and your role in front of them. I think that that kind of is the same, um, no matter you know what you're presenting. Because what I tell my students is you know as long as you recognize that your audience is there to see you perform well then you'll approach it as a more symbiotic relationship rather than oppositional. Because I think a lot of people who go into speech or performance instantly become nervous and view the audience as a, as a field of, you know, of judging eyes when in reality they're, they're looking, they really want to see you do well with, with some exceptions, but, (laughs) um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that's just how I approach it, you know. And then, of course, there are details for every category, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's it's a great way to. I mean, I think even a further. Well, we may be saying the same thing, but I think a, a sort of a, an extension or what really worked for me uh, in the theater was to think of it as a giveaway. So not so ne- never about me or how I did as a, and I never was able to kind of translate that into doing film auditions. But but it was basically a giveaway and it was um, so it would just take your worry about performance right out of the equation because it's just something that you're giving away. So it's not for you. It's for, Mm. for your audience. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that's, that's lovely. I think that's a good way to look at it too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have to train for, do you, did you train in some way for, for that field? What I would, did I train? Yeah. I, uh, I argued with my dad constantly when I was a kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was rarely, a great you know what? He loved to, t- to lay claim to why I did so well in debate when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, and that's just because he's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually, when I was younger, I, I, I really argued with everyone all the time. And, uh, awesome. Yeah, I was that kid, and you know, I was the one who would correct the, the teachers in classrooms because that's totally what they want you to do. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> not I ended... always, <laughs> but I, I'm, this, I'm I'm the same guy. I I you know, yeah, I <laughs> I sharpened myself against other people a few times in my life. <laughs> I absolutely love the description that you put out there for uh, Everfree Northwest that's coming out here, where you say you were hatched, not born, vaguely recalling <laughs> siblings twittering about in a wasteland of crack shells. That sounds like me and my brothers. <laughs> you have a stack of brothers, do you? I've got two brothers, yeah, um, both of them younger, and neither of them anywhere even remotely close to what I do, like, you know, with, with coaching or anything. Uh, one is, uh, one's actually at college right now going in, I believe genetics. And the other one is, uh, oh, wow. is a bartender in, uh, West Minneapolis. So, wow. Or the West bank. Yeah. It's, families are very mysterious, aren't they? Yeah. And I would also attribute those two to more of my experience with, <laughs> with argumentation. Well, and the thing is, <laughs> I, I went, I went to college as an undergraduate to go to, uh, to, to study actually classical civilization. I, I got my degree oh. in that. And then uh, I found that I was telling people how to argue all the time or telling people how to, how to communicate. And so now I'm, yeah, now I'm getting my master's degree in education. So, Huh. Telling people how to argue. Yes. Uh, and, and, well, not the interpersonal type argument, more of persuasive type argument. Huh. So argument, Greek, Greek word argument, uh, or Greek con- concept of argument. Well, I, that same student I was telling you about, uh, Joey, I, one of the things, when you're a speech coach, you know, especially at a public school, you get dragged into doing things you didn't expect you were going to have to do. And one of the things I had to do not a year ago was drive a bus to a tournament. And, uh, <laughs> and every, every city block, he'd say, you know, Mr. B, can we stop there? Can we stop there? And I told him, I said, you know, I, I immediately, you know, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll stop at one of these stops if you can give me a full Aristotelian argument as to why. <laughs> and I said, you need to prove the logos, ethos, and pathos of it. And that's just evil. Oh, it was totally evil. And the best part was that he finally did it. Um, we passed a really old barn. And he somehow made an argument that the logical reason to stop was that the barn had historical value. The ethos reason to stop was that, you know, he was he was credited as a student, so he knew what ha- had historical value or not. And that the, pa- the pathos side was that that barn was neglected. And oh, wow. I, and I said, Joey, that's an amazing argument, but we've just gotten back to the school. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, no. I don't know. How so, did that happen? You, you've turned it on me. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm oh, just, sure, sure. I'm really cu- now I'm also curious about, I'm looking at the, the logo that's showed up here and it looks like two mantises. 
<laughs> you know what it is? What, it what is, is it? It is a um, it is a neon version of the poison joke flower from one of the episodes uh, from uh, was it bridal gossip, where they go oh. and, and they they tromp through the the flowers and Rarity's mane becomes all messy oh, and. God. Messy. Oh dear. And uh, and and Applejack becomes you know tiny, and uh, Fluttershy gets a hilariously deep male voice, and uh, yeah, she, she gets the is it the Blue Man Kumo voice? Is it the Dragon voice? Yes, it is. It is. It's the blue. It really looks like two mantises to me. Do you see that? I I do now. <laughs> one one behind the other, looking at you know, looking with their kind of differently shaped eyes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can we say hello to you? What are you doing? I don't know. (laughs) You know what? I can imagine those being mantises. Yeah. (laughs) That's crazy. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at. But you know, our filters are all different. (laughs) So speaking of another type of unusual creature, aside from mantises, bronies, um, how do you find the fandom? I mean, I imagine sometimes your interactions can be a little bit awkward. No, not at all. Not at all. I I actually, I find uh, a lot of the fandom um, a, a, a real relief. Um, they, they, they are, you know, they, they're, they can be quite nutty and they can be, but there, but there's a, there seems to be like a base um, innocence. And I do feel when I'm speaking to most people in the fandom that I'm speaking to the part of them that is an alive child. And I'm always happy to speak to a, a, a living, yeah, chi- so, a living child. Me. You know, when, 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 when the child inside a man is injured or, or dead, that's when they do damage. That's when they're you know, dangerous to society, but when, but when they're just glowing and creative and, you know, um, in community, primarily when they associate in community and they're not, you know, cutting themselves off from other people, I don't feel that there's anything unsafe or unlovable or wrong with any of those people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. You know, it actually reminds me of the the car- the, the actual strip cartoon. Uh, was it Calvin and Hobbes? Um, I, it, it was a newspaper cartoon. You know, features a six year old kid and his imaginary friend Hobbes, who's this uh, stuffed tiger. But anyway, uh, one person once described that as really a reflection of of like transcendental philosophy. The idea is that, you know, you're looking at the world through child. I think the way that Emerson put it was like childlike wonder. And I think, I think in a sense, that's kind of what you're getting out of this fandom is that kind of transcendental approach. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the bulk of people that write to me. They're just, you know, I, 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 I really feel, you know, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about the entire idea of fan because or the word because it, it me it's you know it's based in the word fanatic and I really believe um with everything in my being that we're all one guy. We're all one you know one entity and um and I don't it doesn't seem like a fair exchange you know, I don't want to take somebody's power by going, yes, I'm so fabulous. Let me soak up or adorate, <laughs> you know, um, and it's and I hope it's not just weird freaking false modesty or, or anything like that. Um, but I I really want I want to always think of people as whole beings and I don't want to feel severed from them or feel more important or get my head all screwed up because it's it's quite easy to happen you know um yeah when people tell you that you're great for a thing that you do that's really being one above monkey (laughs) (laughs) well you know what though i think the thing is that uh i think what you're kind of running into a bit is is a problem that i i've heard from a lot of the you know the staff of the show which is this conflation between and i don't know if that's a word but i'm going to assume it is um between conflation i mean conflating i know but uh between uh you know you as the actress and the character 
I've noticed right. that that's uh, yeah. sometimes the problem is that people, when they write to Tabitha St. Germain, they think they're writing to Rarity, when in reality they're writing to Rarity's voice actress. And right. I think some people don't make that distinction. And, I, and that's maybe where you're running into some of that. But on the other hand, I would say that, you know, the surprise fandom, you know, that sprung up online and, you know, things like this interview, for example, are kind of evidence that you guys are all doing an amazing job. And, and I think you guys should own it because you definitely, you know, you do an incredible job. It, it, and I think you should be proud well, of it. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I love the job that we do do. Um, uh, but I, th- I, I just want to kind of reframe it more as a, a mutual admiration society. <laughs> because sure. um what's you know what's happening is that other people are, are also creating and it's not less than it's it's astonishing stuff that they're creating astonishing drawings astonishing scripts guys sending me whole musicals <laughs> whole huge pieces of music most of them are based on the show but that he can do it at all speaks to what it's possible for him to do. Um, so I, I really, I just, I want to think of it as a mutual, um, admiration society and, uh, <laughs> rather than, uh, rather than some, uh, us and themness. Cause I, I feel like that's old world and I do own it. Like I do love what I, you know, what I do and I love uh, the people that I work with, but I also, um, I, I cannot, uh, you know, you can't live in a projection, right? Uh, yeah. It, it's because uh, basically it's it's just it isn't real. However, I recognize that you want sometimes to play in a projection. You know, uh, you want to play when I write things. I want to live in, in that projection when I so and so very often what people are writing and uh, asking is, will you come and play pony with me? <laughs> we, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Play ponies with me, and I'm like, oh, ah, can I do it without a script in front of me? I, I don't know if I can remember it. I don't know if I can get into that gear. <laughs> right here, I am. I'm not ready. I won't be rushed, but you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> eventually, I can sometimes arrive there and play ponies. But I, I can't always do it because I'm in my own gears of things that I'm. Uh, imagining and daydreaming about and fantasizing about and uh, and that's all part of our massiveness of creativity as human beings. So um, I have no idea. No, I think I know what you're getting at there. I think you're kind of. I mean, and tell me if I'm paraphrasing this wrong, but I think what you're trying to say is that you know those scripts and those works of art, in a sense, of are projection of their own. How to put it? Brilliance. I'm, yeah, it, they're brilliant. It's wonderful. It's to be celebrated. You know, what have you observed of the online fandom? Do you you've mentioned that you've once or twice dabbled in certain websites, <laughs> uh, but and you get sent a lot of stuff. But do you ever, you know, say go to Google and and just see what people have produced, or do you just kind of, you know, stay away from I, it? In general? I do. I do stay away from it. Um, and as I said, it's not out of any antipathy. People people send me links periodically, and uh, sometimes they send me links with a caveat. You know, if you don't have a strong stomach, don't look at this, and I don't. Um, however, I've I've uh, you know the one chap sent me uh, music that he wrote. It, it was uh, it was about about the characters, and he the, this is just extraordinary. Um, he just had this extraordinary sense of musical theater. It was it, it pretty amazing. And he wrote number after number, and he's got them all posted on YouTube. And um, so I, I did look at uh, quite a few of those. And uh, this girl, Vixie Victoria Rollins, she sent me a lot of drawings, and uh, I looked at her stuff on DeviantArt that she sent me. But these are, you know, the things that I've looked at, generally speaking, have been things that people have sent to me to my website address. Uh, but I don't, I don't go into Equestria Daily or uh, other people's blogs or sites because, you know, I just feel a bit of an interloper. And I do feel like, even though I think people do sort of uh, solicit you and want you to 
check it out. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a very odd feeling. It's a very odd feeling to see your name in so many different contexts and, uh, you know, good or bad. And it's also a huge time suck <laughs> because yeah. I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I barely see my friends and family as it is. And, and, I, and I work quite a bit. So, and I have things that I love to do. I love to write as well. And I love to paint really badly. And I spend a great deal of time in the garden and, um, you know, uh, and hanging out with the animals and stuff like that. And that's what, what really shakes my money maker. Well, maybe not my money maker, <laughs> the thing for my money maker. It does nothing <laughs> at all for my money maker, but that's what I like to do. So I, that, I spend, you know, most of my free time doing that. And if I'm in front of the computer, I want a result. I want a short story. I want a long story. I want a scene. I want, you know, uh, recording. If I'm going to spend time in front of the computer, I want results from my impending blindness for having stared at the screen for hours and hours. So I'm not going to yeah. play. I know what you're talking about. I actually, uh, I bought myself a uh, 1938 typewriter. Um, and I thought, okay, this is how I'll get writing because nowadays, <laughs> you know, especially with, uh, with the internet, you know, you, uh, you get distracted just so easily and there's just so much media out there. I mean, this fan mm-hmm. improves that of course, but there's, you know, you know, just, just at any given time. And I thought I would, I would get typing and the typewriter works and it's still sitting in its box, but you know, <laughs> I, I think I know what you're talking about though, because I think a lot of people, get sucked into digital media and, and then, you know, they kind of let one minute turn into two hours, turn into four hours. And especially with someone like you, I mean, you, you've got so much better stuff to do. Well, almost. Mm, let's take the joke <laughs> out of that because I, I can get very, you know, I look at something on YouTube, you know, pictures of pretty kittens and puppies and things, and then it'll add, you know, and I'll end up hours later looking at, how to raise chickens on, you know, the island of Booba, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm serious. I can get as sucked in as the next person. But I, so that means that I, I do have to consciously kind of shake myself out of getting into those kind of trances because, you know, you just can pass so much of your life. And it seems to me that time, well, I don't know if this is only my experience, but time just seems to have sped up or something and there don't seem to be as many hours in the day and I'll you know you wake up in the morning and boom it's lunch and ah, dinner and you know <laughs> then you wake up and it's time to meditate so it's uh uh yeah um being being disciplined not not in a, a massive way not so that you have an inner Nazi but to the degree that you can get something out of life that you actually want you know, that it's not just kind of bunking you around and, you know, you're just kind of uh, being yanked from one entertainment to the next. It's it's important to me um, to have some, to, you know, to exercise a, a little bit of control, a little bit of uh, self-discipline. It, it just makes me feel uh, better. I know that's probably not a very popular thing to say, but... No, um, I think it's a, it's a good thing to say. I do know... Uh, I heard one study once on on NPR here in the states, and I I really liked the study because it, it seemed like a you know a good scientific reason to have this philosophy. But it was it was asking people you know because this is a, a phenomenon that apparently as people age, and I've noticed I've noticed I've know that I've noticed this in my life as well that as people age, you know, time seems to go faster. And so apparently some researchers at some university or another did a survey of this, and they found that what it might be is that. Because as you gain more experiences through life, um, you're more used to more situations. They don't seem to feel as um, drawn out as they would before. And so their solution for trying to you know, live in the moment, as it were, to, was to try as many new experiences as possible. Because that way your brain is you know, playing catch up a bit and it kind of slows things down a bit. And I really like that attitude because mm-hmm. it, you know, it kind of tells you, hey, go out and do something new. Well, I like. I like that as an I I like that very much as an idea because I think the more you, time you spend, not necessarily being happy, but but chase not chasing, but doing the things that really fulfill you, like really make you purr like a kitten. You forget time. You forget what the time 
is and what's passing. And and that's that's when you that's what I love. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're able to lose yourself in something that you're writing or whatever, as long as it's not someone or something else's agenda, then you're being run. Then someone else or something else is running their energy through your body and your systems. And that's not not very, it's not going to be too helpful to you. But, you know, if you are creating something and you allow that flow to happen and, and just sort of feel taken away by it and feel just kind of like, that purr. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesomeness. Right. Well, yes. I, you know, well, I'm interested to know, though, being that you're going to be going to Everfree Northwest in August, you know, what you're expecting or what you're hoping to see from the fans in person, because there are going to be, you know, a good thousand bronies there, a lot of them in, you know, various costumes who are all... <laughs> Huge fans of yours. I mean, uh, how do you how do you look at that kind of an event? And have you really been in that kind of uh, situation before? Uh, well, Comic Con, uh, I'm not. First of all, terribly, terribly good in crowds. I just get a little overstimulated, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah. So um, I need a thunder blanket. You know what that is? You know what they give to dogs that that can't take thunder. <laughs> Any one of those, I think Andrea was saying she was going to let me vomit in her purse at Comic-Con, but oh, I didn't no. have to. <laughs> um, I did not vomit in Andrea's purse. However, I did come home to a note on my bed in the hotel room that said, we have pooed in your bed <laughs> from <laughs> Kathy and Andrea. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's probably telling tales out of school. <laughs> no, that's um, all right. That's quite all right. <laughs> they had not, in fact, pooed in my bed, but they said they left me a note that said they had. Um, uh, um, uh, what do I expect? Well, you know, um, when when I was in San Diego, uh, I was looking out at, at that sort of rainbow of people with. Uh, pony ears and stuff and wigs and it was just like a mass of color um uh we were asked questions and it was all kind of kind of i was like i could i had a hard time answering but then we uh after the whole event was over and we were roaming the streets uh i met a pair of bronies we came across a pair of bronies who knew who we all were one of them his name was quinn told me that he had skipped the Firefly panel in order to be at the My Little Pony event. And I was like, oh, my God, because I would have given my eye teeth, several of my toes, perhaps a lung, uh, any spare kidneys I might have had to go and see Joss Whedon and the Firefly panel. So I was so <laughs> impressed by that. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, so what, what I'm saying basically is that I, I really kind of love to meet people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I like to look into people's eyes and, uh, and, and talk to them, uh, uh, <laughs> kind of a bit, a bit more than being on a panel. Um, however, if I am on a panel and if somebody is at the, uh, at the event, Ask me the most absurd question possible, and I'll be the most comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think people will prepare absurd questions for you now, and I think that will be amazing. <laughs> I, yeah, and you know, I I'm going to be hosting that panel, so I'm looking forward to that as well. <laughs> Um, okay. it's just going to be, I think it's going to be a fun convention. Um, you know, these brony conventions really, I think in a lot of ways reveal what we were talking about earlier, which is that, that kind of childlike sense of wonder in a sense, but really that kind of, you know, that just general positive camaraderie because yeah, we're a community in a sense that is based in the internet, which means we hear a lot of voices. We see a lot of video streams, but we don't really meet in person as often as we ought to. I mean, there are meetups, et cetera, but you know, I think that these conventions can be uh, a really good chance for people to have more of an interpersonal connection. It sounds like that's really what you value out of, you know, out of that as I well. Do. Yeah, I, I, I just understand it more than, and I think that's it's just simple, simply a matter of what a person can digest and how much information they can assimilate at one, uh, at one giving. And uh, and I just like the one, I like the one on one. I like to meet people, and um, you know, yeah. 
Sure. I, I love those two bronies I met on the street were the highlight of, uh, of the, um, the trip to San Diego for me. And it was just because they were actual faces uh, and I saw the eyes and I felt the vibration and they were like right, you know, like right square on. And I was like, oh, humans. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the one fellow said to me, I'm sorry, I can't treat you like a human being. That was the first thing he said. And then seconds later, we were talking about Joss Whedon and the Firefly panel and we were speaking like human beings, you know, uh, like, like you like one does like geek to geek. And uh, and so. So that's, that's, yeah. Well, I think that everybody can share in the absolute wonder and, and pure um, geekery of Firefly. I, I, think that, <laughs> I think we all can <laughs> because... It's so awesome, is it not? It's so great. And then they came out with Serenity, and then they never came out with a sequel to that. And they killed Wash. Why? Why would you I do that? No, Leaf on the wind. He floated <laughs> like a leaf on the wind. Oh. It was such a great movie. <laughs> such a great movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay, well, I think I've got one last question for you. And this is okay. this is the evil question I ask everybody. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, and, and listeners to the program know of this question, and they expect it oh. from me. So I, I almost owe them this question. And the question okay. is this. Is there something you would like to see specifically from the fandom and know this, that if you make a request, it will probably be met very, very quickly. <laughs> and that's an something evil question. Like <laughs> from the fandom. Wow. I asked Jason Teeson that question and he was saying that he wanted to see there's a fan video game being built. He said, build that already. <laughs> wow. You know, it just, it just varies. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of the lad and, Oh, forgive me. I totally cannot remember the name because the Filofax is shut down. But um, I'm thinking of the lad who wrote me all of those musical numbers. And uh, I would like to see the, the the My Little Pony musical. I would like to see it on, in theaters starring pure bronies. <laughs> that And nobody... And I, like I said, that's something now that may very well happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would like to see the most. And, you know, I mean, as well, I'd, I'd like to see people create their uh, original works. Uh, you know, uh, um, there's stuff that's, uh, and, and I probably shouldn't say this, but but not related to MLP. Because I look at it and I'm like, well, but this this is a property and it's going on and you can't you know, you can't break into the, you can't break into this and not in any pejorative way. I can't break into the writing of it either. And I'm a writer, but I would like to see people spinning, you know, spinning off and actually creating original works, but, you know, using it as a springboard in that, in that regard kind of thing. Um, and not being discouraged by the fact that, that the, the doors to this, this show are, you know, are, well, that it's all sewn up, you know, that it's all kind of happening where it's happening. Because it's, you know, it's not the point. The point is, oh, my God, look at how much everybody is making and making not in a vacuum, making with one another. That's the that's the truly amazing thing. There really and they, is a they sense have of community, yeah. It says, yeah. Well, Tabitha, it's been an absolute and complete honor on my part uh, to speak with you today. I know on behalf of all the bronies out there, we all want to thank you for, you know, taking this time to talk directly to the fans. I know we all appreciate it. And I know we're all looking forward to seeing you at Everfree Northwest next month. So, again, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And I'm completely honored to be here and talking to all y'all. All y'all. And I'll I'll see some of you at uh, Everfree. Well, everybody, Tabitha St. Germain is the voice of Rarity, Granny Smith, Luna, and a certain <laughs> Phoenix, <laughs> uh, <laughs> among other roles in the show. Again, thank you, and you have been listening to Everfree Radio. So I just didn't bother. <laughs> But uh, I read for Rarity, and I, I believe, I'm not c completely sure, because it's so long ago in the sands of time, that they had, uh, as a reference, Audrey Hepburn. And mm -hmm. I'm wretched at doing impressions or anything like that, but I, I sort of knew what they meant, that she had that graciousness and 
sort of extension of acceptance and welcome. And yet she had this very posh sounding, pretty, really pretty, really clear voice. Um, so I took that and then didn't do it. <laughs> then did something else that just gradually got a bit more and more egoic, I suppose. Um, uh, ego is very funny. There's nothing funnier than somebody with a massive ego. Uh, <laughs> and I think Rarity's got it. Oh, you know, she's got a, a, a healthy sized uh, ego, which makes it easy for her to to fall distances and rise up distances. So, <laughs> so I really like playing her. Is, does that answer your question? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that you know, that's that's actually a great beginning to the. I was going to say you you said you mentioned that you originally had intended to uh, to model her a little bit off of Audrey Hepburn, but I got to say when I heard your performance as Rarity, I'm always reminded of Catherine Hepburn. Oh um, wow. Yeah, I, 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 it's particularly there's one moment in one episode. I believe it's a uh, sister who's social where you, where you go, what have I done? And and it's it just <laughs> ranged, you know, immediately had that image in my mind. What did she have? Did she, was, uh, was that war- warble in there somewhere? Well, I think it, I think it was more of an earlier Catherine Hepburn, maybe not the <laughs> the one from the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, but you know, it's weird. She's definitely. She's definitely got that sense of sophistication to her, and you're right. She's got that that ego that that kind of shines through. But she also has almost an innocence about it. Like she's not aware yeah. that she sounds that way. Well, you know, frequently, I I think it's astonishing, but frequently people with massive egos are really innocent. Uh, you know, because there is a little bit of a blind side about themselves, right? So, uh, uh, well, that would explain me. Oh! I, I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now. You <laughs> <laughs> You're love. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Everfree Radio. And I am here today with a guest that I've been looking forward to, to speaking with for a long time. I know a lot of you out there have been looking forward to hearing from her, Tabitha St. Germain. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Well, and again, I just want to thank you right off the bat for joining us. I know that you've got an incredibly busy schedule, and, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Oh, my pleasure. I'm, I'm very hoarse because I've, I've been uh, yelling and screaming all day long. Uh, but uh, horses are things that we're all fond of. So, <laughs> and I think everybody was thinking that pun right as you made it. <laughs> I know, I know. Why did I even say it? Because you have to say the obvious sometimes. Do you mind if I call you Final Draft? Oh, y- you can if you'd like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, let me just ask a general question just right off the bat. How did you become involved with My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic? Well, sir... <clears throat> As happens, I got a call that I had an audition for My Little Pony. Mind you, I've been in, like, okay, I've been in, I think, probably four generations of it already beforehand. Uh, Played Minty and Wisteria and, ooh, Thistle Whistle and somebody and Hoojima Flip and a little star thingy. Uh, and uh yeah but memorable characters all of them memorable characters all no i love playing minty i think uh pinkie pie is the new minty and yeah so so and i was told when, uh, when i went in for the audition not to do anything i'd done before so i steered very cl- i didn't actually read for pinkie pie or for um or for fluttershy because she was the wisteria corollary and um, so I just and also I looked at Pinkie Pie and I went, oh, she's got to freak out and be a mental case through this whole thing. <laughs> so I just oh, today that day I was like, oh, this just looks so hard. <laughs> Ask me this all the time. You know, well, can I teach a class or whatever and tell me how you do things? And I, I don't actually know um, <laughs> how, how I do things. You, you just do them. 
And I'm sure it's based on everything that I've listened to before. And, um, you know, I think of all those great, those great old um, villains that, uh, you know, the, mm, not Cruella de Vil, I'm thinking of one of these queens, I think it was in Sleeping Beauty or so, or Snow White or something. Oh, there's like uh, Maleficent or I can't that's, remember her name. Yes, that's precisely it. And I, and I was thinking of, of that and, and uh, or I wasn't thinking of it, but, you know, it's in my vocabulary of stuff that I saw of of people uh and you and you you always wonder about them you always wonder about when somebody's really just behaving so cut off and so um into power what can they possibly believe do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and they must be believing in some kind of they must be afraid, essentially. If they have to control other people's behavior, they have to make them do what they need to be. They must be, they, they must be afraid. There must be, again, a little squishy thing in there. So, um, so I, I kind of love that. I still don't know how it happens, though. You just open your mouth and stuff comes out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be working. I mean, at people all I know tons of people who, you know, name your characters as their favorites. And, and a big reason why is just the, is the acting behind it. And I've also, you know, spoken or Everfree Radio has spoken with a lot of the voice talent of the show. And time and again, we hear the same thing. Tabitha is such an inspiration. Honestly, I hear that from I heard that from Ashley Ball. I heard that from uh, from uh, Kathy at one point. Uh, you know, just Andrea, of course, and and they all say the same thing. And it's funny when you say you don't know how they do it because they all say that they kind of look to you in a sense as a mentor in, <laughs> in some regards. Well, um, I think it's a sort of a. Um, I think that with uh, younger actors, I've definitely by being a complete nut job, given them permission to be nut jobs. <laughs> and that's the only <laughs> way I can see that that would, that because I, I, you know, I never say, I've, I've never said to someone, you know, if I do murmur, murmur with my voice, then I achieve because I, I don't know. I honestly don't know how I come by it uh, or how it comes by me, I should say. So, yeah, but but I think by being at ease with it and also treating it really quite lightly, because even though it's serious and it's your career and uh, people are watching you can be in the hundreds of thousands sometimes. And if you thought about it, you would lose your mind. It's a it's a serious job like everything, but you need to take it lightly, you know, Um, and because you need as a voice actor permission to play. And muck about and fail, fail <laughs> massively. No, you need permission to fail more than anything. You know, you need to be in the mind of a little tiny child uh, with the doll and just marching it around the table with with your other doll characters and going, you did this. I don't like you. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had any catastrophic failures then in your career? I'm just curious. Brazilians, <laughs> Brazilians, hundreds of thousands, and I count them as the best things that have happened to me. Mostly, at my my like my most colossal failures have happened uh, in on camera auditions because I'm shy, basically, and because I have a hard time remembering lines. And so sometimes, you know, I went to an audition for um, oh, what's that new series? Not grim, but uh, it's the fairy tale thing. Oh, uh, ha- never ha- happily never after. Oh, what happily, is it? Happily, I know what you're talking about. I think it's happily ever after. And um, I went into audition for a uh, what do you call it? a fairy godmother. And um, at the time, in order to get over to get over myself, essentially, I'd been doing this YouTube <laughs> show about a fairy that gets uh, that possesses the body of a. Um, extremely conservative uh, legal secretary <laughs> to do a cooking show in order to do a cooking show. So, and I've been posting these, these little episodes uh, periodically on the tube. So I get this audition and it's for a fairy godmother. I'm like, Oh, I've got 
this. I've actually got a fairy crown. I've got a wand. I've got the silly clothes. And I went all decked out, like all decked out to this audition. Lee, come on. <laughs> well, but you know, aside from that, though, I mean, yeah, Rarity never does come off as too egotistical. That was actually something, one of the original things I noticed about her character as a new fan of the show, that she... You know, you would expect the stereotypical, you know, um, posh character to be arrogant, to be, you know, you know, to have that tone of voice, but also to have a certain snideness behind it. Yeah. And, and she doesn't have that. No, no. You're looking for the kind of nastiness because oftentimes when there's vanity, you have to defend the vanity. You know, you see a really beautiful woman walking down the street and oftentimes she's like, what? There's a there's a kind of like a <laughs> little kind of <laughs> stop looking at me kind of thing because you have to defend that that uh the the vanity the the you know it's an illusion right so there's there's a lot invested in sort of keeping a distance from because it's 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 made out of eggshells and paper mache it's just completely bustable so um indeed yeah so often so often like massive egos hide really squishy cores <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and often there's a great deal of innocence, and that's that's just how opposites work, and it's a lovely it's a lovely thing, and it's why you can forgive somebody sometimes, you know, or often yeah, that just operates with more ego than you may be used to, you know. Yeah, well, and the thing is too, when you're talking about this this exploration of ego through the, through the character, you know, uh, there's another character you play one. My personal favorite character of the entire show, um, named uh, Luna, which I think everybody out there, you know, <laughs> is excited to hear about as well. She has an episode in season two, Luna Eclipsed, where she really goes through that whole gambit. She starts off as incredibly, you know, haughty, using that tone of, uh, you know, that loud speaking tone. And I mean, of course, that's somewhat through the writing. But then she, by the end of the episodes, has a bit more of the innocence to it. And I, I just wanted to know if for you that episode was almost an exploration of that separation as it were because it seems like you try to mix those elements for rarity but for luna it's a little more exaggerated yeah oh, i hadn't really thought of a correlation between the two but that's that's an interesting thing um yeah you know i i don't really know i don't really know how uh how, uh people at 